Good afternoon, William and Mary. Thank you for joining us for this afternoon's community conversation. I'm gonna say just a few words by way of introduction and then I'm gonna introduce our guests. Thinking back on the week since this pandemic began, the key through line has been how much we all long for a swift recovery. For many of us, the last two weeks have felt harder emotionally. For students and staff and faculty, we're entering the most stressful time of the semester end of classes and exams. And at the same time, I think many of us are coming to realize how long the impact of COVID-19 will be for William and Mary, for our Commonwealth and for our nation. A lot more adaptation lies ahead. That's the challenge and also the opportunity facing William and Mary right now. We know we cannot return to the campus of last year but we can imagine and define what successful return this coming year might look like. So William & Mary is actively planning for next year, right now this month. I've charged a small team with this task to bring back to me by the end of the month, potential adaptations that will allow us to come study together and work together safely. There's a campus message going out later today about this. And I want right now uh, at midday to talk about the underlying mindset that we're bringing to that planning process. Three principles of adaptation are important in that planning. The first is that we're gonna continue to do everything that we can to self safeguard the health of our community. The second is that we're gonna work collaboratively with campus leaders, student, faculty, and staff leaders with our partners around the Commonwealth to identify the best solutions. And the third is that we will foreground creativity and flexibility in order to meet the different needs of students, faculty, and staff. Creativity, flexibility, and that great question, how might we? Those are the things that bring me to this week's topic, entrepreneurial thinking at William & Mary. Right from the beginning, as we imagined these weekly community conversations, I knew I wanted this to be one. I'm grateful to be joined today by Professor Graham Henshaw, Executive Director of the Entrepreneurship Center, also a serial new venture founder and VC, and also a key member of our Plan Ahead team. Sam Pressler, a 2015 alum and also a founder of Armed Services Arts Partnership, ASAP. Natalie Marco Tulio, a 2019 grad and also director of marketing for Map My Customers. And Sonali Gobin, class of 2020. Congratulations, Sonali. And also a former Miller Center fellow, one of the student leaders in our entrepreneurship hub. Welcome, everybody. So we've planned, we've planned this conversation in two parts. First, I'm going to invite Professor Henshaw to talk about what we mean by entrepreneurial thinking how that fits into a liberal arts university and how William and Mary's entrepreneurship hub responded during COVID-19. Then I'm gonna bring our student and alumni guests in for a panel discussion about how they are applying entrepreneurial thinking, that mindset today. So let me kick things off, Graham, with um, the, the obvious question. When most people hear the E word, entrepreneurship, they mean starting a business. That's what they think that means. But that's not what you mean when you talk about entrepreneurial thinking. So can you talk a little bit about that shift in mindset? Yes, that's right. Uh, yeah, that is the, the normal thing that people think about, startups, new ventures. Uh, but we focus on something a little bit different at William and & Mary, and, and we've called that entrepreneurial thinking. And I think uh, it'll help to bring up a graphic on the screen because we mean something very specific when we say entrepreneurial thinking. So on the screen, we have what we call the pillars of this concept. And this really is the, the foundation of the focus of our Entrepreneurship Center and our mission. Uh, our mission is to equip students to think and act like entrepreneurs. And that means that they develop these skills and a mindset characterized by these traits. So I'll run down through these, and then I think they're really going to come to life as we talk uh, to our guests. So first on the, on the mindset, so these are the traits on the left, openness to risk. This means that we turn towards opportunity even when there is a chance of failure. Next, we've got tolerance for ambiguity. This is resisting the urge to try to predict the future, perhaps something that we need right now. And instead, 
you take one step and you understand what the what the market or the landscape is looking like and then you take the next step after that grit sustained perseverance towards a long-term goal and then finally self-direction uh, this is not waiting for instruction uh, but a bias towards action so those are mindsets that are characteristic of an entrepreneurial thinker and then on the right we have these skills and by the way, the skills research shows that we can really move the needle on these. We can train our students and our audiences how to be stronger uh, on this set of skills. So first, opportunity discovery. This one's really important. It's the ability to spot opportunities where other people don't see them. Sometimes people see a problem. Most of the time, people don't see anything. Uh, but an entrepreneurial thinker sees an opportunity. Uh, the next is failing wisely. This one bumps up against a myth about entrepreneurs that we swing for the fences every time. Uh, but instead, failing wisely means that we make experiments with learning at the core. These experiments are, are ones where we're trying to learn about our hypotheses about something. And we only risk what we can afford to lose. Next is improvisation. This is putting something again out into the world and adjusting course as necessary. This is built around this saying that no plan survives first contact with customers. So we have to be flexible. We have to be able to improvise. And then finally, we have collaboration, the ability to pull in different perspectives than your own to try to address these challenges that we find ourselves in, in all kinds of entrepreneurial contexts. So when we talk about entrepreneurial thinking and our mission, this is what we're talking about. We, we want to amplify students' abilities to have these traits so that they can go on and change the world in all kinds of different uh, ultimate outcomes. That um, speaks us clearly to a liberal arts commitment to range in how we think and to testing our thinking process, to growing that critical capacity, that flexibility of mind can, I, I will say I'm so thrilled that we have a new hub right here at the heart of campus on Richmond Road. And I thought maybe you could talk a little bit about how the hub has adapted its own operations under the pandemic. Yes. So we certainly have, have tried to practice what we preach. Uh, and I'm really proud of my team. So we have uh, a 20 person student uh, workforce that really supports the operations that happen in the entrepreneurship hub uh, and the Miller Center, and they really stepped up. They demonstrated uh, grit and certainly improvisation. As we met now seven weeks ago, when we realized that the safest thing was for us all to, to stay home and not come back to the hub, which we're so excited to open, but the safest thing was gonna be for us to stay home. We made the decision in that meeting that we would move our programming online, uh, similar to the, to the faculty across William & Mary that were making that same decision and making those changes to their courses, we quickly figured out how we could deliver the value of our programming in a different modality. Uh, and I, I'd like to say it was like we flipped a switch, but it wasn't. We had 20 people really working very hard to convert what was weekly events in the vibrant entrepreneurship hub into different modalities of virtual experiences, whether they were live like this one uh, or whether they were asynchronous. But certainly as we did that, uh, we leveraged improvisation, but we're also failing wisely. Uh, we, we tried some things in the first few weeks that didn't work, but because we have the skill set, we know how to use those lessons and move forward quickly and, and improve uh, our offerings. Can you give us just one quick example of how the students have been using that skill set in the current environment? Yeah, so uh, certainly Im improvisation, I think, is, is one that um, I can see. Our team has very specific roles. And in the meeting that we had when we realized we were not going to come back to campus, those roles sort of went out the window. And instead, we became a scrappy sort of startup team ourselves where we all had to pitch in and do what was necessary to move that one block across the Trello board that we used to, to manage our process. But we all became sort of scrappy co-founders. So our roles were sort of improvised. As we were improvising our programming, we had to work together differently to make that happen. You guys used Trello 
I'm a super fan of Trello. Um, yes, one, we do. One of the most supple, quick to you, to learn, uh, robust tools I know I know out there. So I, I want to bring Natalie, Sonali, and Sam into this conversation. And ask you each really briefly if you could talk about some aspect, some mindset um, from this set that's been useful to you in cultivating resilience. Yeah, I'm happy to get us started. Um, for me, I definitely say tolerance for ambiguity. I chose to work for a startup after school, which there's no real clear path similar to, you know, anyone else who might have a better idea of what their company and what their industry is like. And especially during this time, my startup, you focus on an industry that is built on face-to-face -face communication. So as the director of marketing, everything we've done in the past, all of our messaging, all of our budget even got cut. And rather than taking that and being scared or saying, you know, there's not a lot to do, we pivoted to what the market wanted and we've actually seen some of the best results to date. Um, our audience really appreciated the fact put out material for free and just how to help them during this time. And it was honestly one of the easiest <laughs> pieces of marketing I've ever done just because we were able to adapt. Sonali. I can go next. Um, and so, because I'm a graduating senior, you know, like a lot of my um, fellow friends, um, a lot of us are getting bad emails every day in our inbox about job offers being rescinded, internships being canceled, and, you know, job applications um, no longer hiring. And so I think, you know, being at William & Mary and going through this William & Mary entrepreneurial mindset and being trained um, two of the aspects that I've been using are grit and failing wisely. Um, and those have really helped me navigate those very ambiguous waters right now. It's, it wants you to know that we're doing something similar on the William & Mary side in an entrepreneurial mode, bringing all of the different human beings that think about career pathways together in a single unified team this spring to be able to make much more robust your field of connections among our wonderful 100,000 alumni, thinking about how we can do that for our alumni as well. So um, it's great to know that there's an opportunity to work with you on that, and we'd love your input as we as we test how to do that. Well, Sam. Awesome, yeah, thank you for having me. I think a lot from my experience with the Armed Services Arts Partnership, or ASAP, um, which high level, we're a nonprofit that cultivates community and growth with veteran service members and their families through the arts. I actually started at William & Mary um, and it really started from a bias towards action where I um, was doing research for a William & Mary government class and learned about um, some of the mental health challenges in the veteran space and connected them to uh, personal challenges. In my family, I had a close family member die by suicide. And think about how I use humor and comedy in the arts to cope and grow following that period and actually launched a comedy program for the veteran military community of Hampton Roads based on that bias towards action. And I also think about kind of how I went from a student organization to a full nonprofit organization with this openness um, to risk and, and a desire to fail wisely. So I was about uh, midway through my senior year, I was considering some more traditional professional options. And at the same time, the student organization we were running at William Mary was starting to get real traction. We were serving close to 100 people through our programs. We we're starting to see strong anecdotal outcomes. Um, we were on some national media. And I had to ask myself the question, you know, if not now, when, and if not me, who? Uh, and I decided to forego some of the more traditional professional options and apply for some um, apply for some fellowship and funding programs. And I was literally two weeks, it was, wasn't until two weeks after I graduated from college that I found out that I got a $80,000 fellowship from the Echoing Green Foundation to take my student organization uh, and turn it into a nonprofit. But I was able to do that because of an openness to risk, but also an understanding that I was in a position where I could kind of take that chance. Um, whereas, because I didn't have the obligation because I wasn't in a place of having a significant amount of debt. Um, and so that's kind of how I think about it. Openness to risk is something that we are differently positioned to be able to embrace. And, um, but I'd also add that risk, what counts as risk is different for every person. Um, that's a very situational perception. 
one of the things that's been so powerful to me about this spring is that our, our students and our faculty and staff have made themselves open to risk in a really um, concerted and focused way. Higher ed is not, in fact, known for our risk tolerance <laughs> as an industry. And yet, this community leaned into the risk of moving into distance learning because it had to be now and it had to be me. Everybody knew they had to step in and embrace that risk in the best way they could. Um, so uh, that's been resonating with me a lot as I thought about what of these, which of these pillars see us through. I'll ask one more question, then I'll, I'll kick it over to Professor Henshaw. Um, I, this question is for Natalie. When we were talking about this conversation, you had a really interesting story about the moment when you recognized that entrepreneurial thinking was the mode that you used. I'm curious if you could talk about that moment of recognition again. Yeah, definitely. So just for a bit of background, I came into William Mary on the track team. That was my whole life. And unfortunately, my sophomore year got very injured and had to stop and really just had to redefine myself and my entire college career. So I tried entrepreneurship. I went to a meeting because I had a friend who was said, come to this club meeting with me. And I said, I have nothing to do. Why not? <laughs> And before that, I'd never thought about entrepreneurship. I assumed it was kind of for males who went to Harvard and coded. I never thought I was, could be someone who could be entrepreneurial. And I went to one rocket pitch and I was like, oh, this is interesting. The, the way they think, it's kind of the way I've always thought, but I've been told that's not the traditional way of learning. Told learning step by step, you don't want to risk yourself. You don't want to fail. So it was really reassuring to me to realize that there is a correct way or not another way maybe for learning and that these skills I've always naturally sort of had could actually be successful at something. Still remember your first rocket pitch, <laughs> Natalie. <laughs> yes, I've done. And after that meeting, I did like 10 rocket pitches after that. So definitely everyone I've give it a I've try. I've recycled differently because of you. <laughs> yes, I was trying to solve recycling. Still, still trying, hopefully one day. Over to you, Graham. Sure. Um, so Sam, uh, you are actually one of our alumni founder speakers uh, in person before we moved to doing that in our in our new format, which has been really awesome in itself. Uh, we've learned a lot of things from that. But you were one of the last to come through uh, in the hub, and you're talking about the the ASAP uh, organization and also about your connections with lots of big name uh, comedians as a result of your role there. And so I was wondering if you could link any of the traits that, that you've observed uh, and even helped build in, in the comedians that you've worked with uh, and those entrepreneurial thinking traits that, that we had up on the screen moments ago. Do you see any links between what makes a strong comedian and, and perhaps some of those entrepreneurial thinking traits? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, it's, it's almost like all of, there's all overlap, so I'll choose a few uh, to highlight. I think the first one that comes to mind is improvisation. Um, I, I think when you think about uh, comedy, particularly improv comedy, uh, it's about saying yes and, and it's about accepting what the world uh, throws at you and then acting on that information and building upon it. And that's something that's very core to comedy, and I think very core to this moment in time when we don't know what the world is going to throw at us. The other piece is grit. And so uh, for folks who don't know, that polished stand-up comedy set you see on Netflix or Comedy Central is the result of like two years of going to open mics and saying the same thing over and over again and just trying to get different input on um, what the audience believes. It also is kind of tied to failing wisely. It's going to those open mics. It's getting the stage time. It's getting the reps so that you know by the time you're ready for that big moment what you have is kind of airtight. So you're failing wisely before the big moment. I think the final piece that's relevant now, both to entrepreneurship um, and to comedy is collaboration. I think people see stand-up comics as these kind of lone individual people, but every stand-up comic has a community of fellow comics that they're workshopping ideas with, that they're coming up with creative projects with. And so when you get on that stage as a stand-up comic, it's not just you alone. You have a whole community that has your back. And that's something that we cultivated in the ASAP program through our stand-up comedy classes and alumni communities. 
I, I think it's it's so telling that just like you said, that Netflix special, it looks like the person's just gifted. Uh, mm -hmm. But in fact, there's a lot more that happens behind the scenes uh, that leads to that that polished look. I think we can we can all take a lot from from that. Um, Sonali, you mentioned uh, uh, also failing wisely and grit, and you're leveraging those in the job search. Can you speak uh, more specifically, what is it exactly might that look like when you receive one of those emails? Because I'm sure there are fellow peers who, who have gotten those. How does it look to use grit or to, to fail wisely uh, in that context? Um, yeah, sure. I mean, you know, definitely it's gutting and it's um, sad and it's not fun. Um, but I do think that entrepreneurial thinking has really taught me how to um, use my skills to get over that quickly. And so something that I've been using is um, failing wisely. And so, you know, if I use one channel, so the traditional job search and sending in my resume, and that doesn't seem to be working out, then, you know, I turn around to our amazing alumni and I reach out to some people to connect to them and try to have a conversation, um, see their, their positions there that they could, they're recruiting for, or I can either go back to our career center at William and Mary. And so it's really just like having all those channels and testing them out to see which one, you know, is working well for you and which one isn't. And so that has been very helpful. And I would definitely also do say grit because at the end of the day, you know, we're all, in this together it's very hard and uh if you don't have the grit and the perseverance to get through it and push through it can be quite hard yeah and i think the important thing to remember about grit is that it's sustained perseverance right it, it there might be short bursts but grit is usually about something that's going to take a while and it's uh, it's trying to achieve that really important goal that you have but it's going to be that sustained perseverance for sure Um, so I mentioned earlier that we've learned a lot uh, at the Entrepreneurship Center and intend to use those lessons uh, moving forward in our programming and how we continue to develop these traits uh, in our audiences that we see at Women & Mary. I'm curious, what are the ways that, that you've developed these, that, that you've all developed, as you said, Sonali, this grit and, and, um, and failing wisely? tolerance for ambiguity, what are the ways that you actually were able to uh, increase your ability in those arenas? And that'll be, I'll, I'll open that up to, to anybody who wants to talk about how, how you've actually developed that, maybe during your time here. Yeah, I could take that one to start. I mean, one thing we used to do in Graham's class was opportunity discovery. So you just walk around and try to see like, what's the problem that I'm having? How can I solve it? And it entirely just shifts your mindset from I'm having problems, this is annoying, to I'm having problems, this could be a business idea. So just anytime you're annoyed, just try to think of a way to solve it. It's really that easy to practice every day. I mean, for me, it's this is a little bit a little bit astray, but the most important thing for me is identifying what is in your control, what is not in your control. Um, and then figuring out how you do everything in your ability to act on what's in your control and how you can accept what's not. And like, that's been the most important trait for me it, building as an entrepreneur, but also just in my personal life. And I think as we have a lot of ambiguity ahead of us, the, the main thing we can control is our individual choices, um, how, we, how we decide to act in the moment, how we decide to respond to things that come at us. And I think that's a lot of what um, is being a good entrepreneur and being an effective human being. Um, I do think for me, I've learned a lot of those skills at the Entrepreneurship Center at William & Mary. Um, you know, I initially thought, like Natalie, um, it was a place where people would go and just pitch ideas and it was a startup machine. But you know, once I went there and I started interacting with a lot of those amazing people who thought out that outside of the box and talking with Professor Henshaw, that really helped me develop a new mindset and a different way of looking at things, which I didn't realize I took away with me. But you know, now in trying times, I really see myself thinking in a different way and 
applying those to my daily life. Can I jump in here and just ask what your majors were, Sam, Natalie, um, and Sonali? Yeah, I was a marketing major with an art and art history minor and then a concentration on entrepreneurship. So all over the place. <laughs> I was a uh, government and finance major, which was very applicable to military arts, as you can imagine. Uh, I am a French and Francophone studies and finance double major. I think you all know that I am an entrepreneur as well, founded a small tech startup for literary texts, um, and I was an English major. Uh, listening to you talk, I'm remembering those moments when I discovered entrepreneurial mindsets. One was just like Natalie's, that sense of kinship. What drew me to literary studies is it's not just that I tolerate ambiguity, but I, I love it. It's immediately generative to me to delay coming to an answer. That for me is part of the practice of tolerating ambiguity is to say, we're going to take some time before we come to an answer, stay curious, gather more information, gather more perspectives. To do that, you have to be able to tolerate the wait, the non-solution, right, the non-answer. And it was literary studies that taught me that, that, that that's why I, I was drawn to it. Um, another aspect, I think, that a moment of recognition for me was iterative work. Grit, failing wisely, is about allowing yourself not to do things perfectly. There's a I learned from software developers the difference between a waterfall mode where you plan everything out and then you jump off the cliff with your entire development process and you create the complete thing and you better hope that it lands well because it's all done at once versus the classic agile process, which is we're going to take a piece of this, work it out, prototype it, test it, pilot it, refine it, and do that again and build incrementally. That, um, phased and exploratory process has been absolutely essential for William and Mary this spring because the conditions were changing so fast on the ground. Um, when I hear you describe the mindsets that you're using, I just keep thinking about how essential they are for success right now. Um, so maybe with that as a transition, I'd like to ask, I want to move to a flash round in closing. So I'm going to ask you three a question, Sam, Sonali, Natalie, in that order. And then you get one sentence if you can to answer it. And then I'll have one for Professor Henshaw. So the sentence is, you get to charge the whole William American community. Let's imagine all 100,000 plus of us are listening. What pillar, what mindset pillar or, or skill do you want us to embrace this coming year and why? For me, it's collaboration. Um, this is a massive collective action problem and we can't do it alone. Uh, and so I just work together. Uh, mine would be tolerance for ambiguity. Um, I know William & Mary students like to have it all prepared out, all mapped out, you know, what you're doing 20 years down the line. Um, but right now, you know, we need to be able to all recenter ourselves and be okay with the fact that the future is uncertain. Yeah, sort of similar, mine's improv. We can't do things the way we used to, so why not try and use this time to make it better? That's, that's wonderful. I resonate with these wonderful words to live by for next year. We're going to hold on to this. Um, Professor Henshaw, we don't have to be done, right? If this gets people excited and they feel like they want to learn more, what can they do? You're exactly right. So one of the adaptations uh, that we made at the, at the center was to create the first ever virtual entrepreneurial thinker scavenger hunt. So we've observed that we have uh, not only these three entrepreneurial thinkers, but many, many more across the William Mary communities. And so there's a link in the YouTube video. Uh, if you if you look in the info section, you'll see a link to the online William and Mary entrepreneurial thinker scavenger hunt. Well, you will discover uh, five members of the tribe and they'll talk uh, you'll find out who they are, and then they'll talk about how they use entrepreneurial thinking as well. So you can continue uh, this adventure, this conversation online if you click there. Thank you. So Graham, Sonali, Natalie, and Sam, thank you so much for joining us today. This has been wonderful. Thank you so much.
And to our far-flung alumni community, keep staying in touch. Please send us your thoughts about which of these eight pillars and skills and mindsets we should be using in the coming year uh, in these challenging times. And I hope you feel as energized by them as I do. I'm going to close the way I always close these days by saying, stay well, William and Mary. <laughs>